The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, folks, uh, Linux Kernel Virtual Machine. Does everybody here know what the KVM is other than me just saying it? All right. Is anybody here doing virtualization already? All right. Anybody using KVM already? Awesome. All right. Uh, before we get started, a little bit about me. If you don't already know me, haven't met me, um, I am loud. I am an independent IT consultant. Uh, well, actually, I'm not an independent IT consultant anymore. I have an actual full-time employee, so I'm an IT consultant. And uh, I don't think the current version of the slides is actually up yet, but by the time you get home tonight, it will be. Uh, there's something there now, but I think it might be a little bit out of date. So let's get started. Um, some of this is, gonna, is probably going to be a little bit less technical than some of you were hoping for, because I'm never quite sure what I'm going to get for a crowd. Before we get started too much, talk a little bit about why KVM. So virtualization itself, one of the things that really initially got me interested in KVM in particular was that when I looked at uh, VMware or Zen or, God forbid, Microsoft's Hyper-V, everybody always had like a very select list of, oh, you can virtualize anything out of this short list of things that you know, we've prepared that we support. And other than that, no. KVM, uh, particularly when I first got started with it, um, by contrast, you could virtualize pretty much anything under KVM because your, your default setup, once you, uh, once you set a, get up, a guest up the first time, you didn't have special drivers and you didn't have a special hack direct kernel bootloader or anything like that. You just literally presented your virtual machine with a very vanilla generic IDE hardware disk controller uh, VGA video and it would use whatever drivers that it had to interface with truly ancient technology and everything would just work. This was pretty cool because this meant that I could virtualize things that nobody had really thought about before. Not just Windows, not just Red Hat Linux or CentOS, but I could throw even something off the wall like PCBSD at it and it would just work without a hitch. Um, I've also been extremely happy with KVM because I've found it to be very high performance. It's very accessible, meaning it's easy to dive right in and start using it. Those of you who didn't raise your hands when I asked who here is already using KVM, it is really, really simple. Uh, you can be up and running and actually doing neat things with it in half an hour. Um, one of the other things that we'll talk about a little bit more later is that uh, you can so a lot of what I use KVM for, um, I will shamefacedly admit, is to virtualize <coughs> Windows. Um, like I said, you know, I do have a consulting business, and uh, my business is mostly focused on helping small businesses suck less. And they have to live in a Windows ecosystem. Um, I can't just be real glib and walk in and say, oh, well, I use Linux, and you should too, because they need things like QuickBooks and AutoCAD and Revit and on down the line that just aren't available in Linux. And you can't expect them to just suddenly disconnect themselves from the entire rest of their business ecosystem and do something that you think is cool. So you need to make it more possible for them to do what they need to do without it hurting them. And KVM can be a really good way to do that. When they have to have Windows servers on the back end, you can actually defang a lot of the things that make Windows servers suck by virtualizing them. Don't put them on the bare metal, uh, run them virtual. Now you can do that in VMware, you can do it in Zen, or you can do it in KVM. Uh, there are a lot of advantages to KVM. Uh, no licensing handles, no vendor lock-in. Uh, I've had to try to extract a running Windows server out of Citrix's Zen Center. Uh, no offense to Russ if he's around. And I, I don't even want to talk about that. Um, KVM, on the other hand, your KVM guests, again, a KVM Windows guest, uh, it, it can, you can configure it to just use a very generic IDE and VGA chipset. Everything completely normal, looks like real hardware. There's no special bootloader, no special nothing. You can extract it very, very easily. In fact, if you wanted to go, for instance, from KVM to VMware, your guest will probably just plain boot. You probably don't even need to run the VMware converter. Um, so that's all pretty nice. So this case study here, this is actually the very first time I was using KVM in production 
uh, for Windows for an actual client. This is, so this, this is a real story. Uh, this, is, this is a small CPA firm and uh, they were using a Windows terminal server and they managed to destroy the one that they had. So when I set them back up again, I said, I'm going to virtualize them. Uh, at the time, I thought that meant that performance was going to be terrible, but I was willing to do it anyway so that I could you know, have image-based backups and all that kind of stuff. What I actually found was that everything was far, far faster on the new one. But all that's not even really the point of the case study here. So I, I got them up and running on a Q6600, if you remember the old Intel Core 2 quads, and that motherboard would only support 8 gigs of RAM. Well, a year later, they had doubled the size of their business, and you know they were having issues where they were just deep into swap constantly because 8 gigs of RAM wasn't enough. So what do you do? Well, if you're not virtualized, you suck it up and you buy a new box and you install Windows Server on it and you install every single app on it and nothing looks the same and everybody hates everything and you have downtime and there's a lot of whining. In this case, however, it was easy. I built a 16-core Opteron box, AMD instead of Intel, server grade instead of consumer grade, whatever, no problem, 64 gigs of RAM. I removed one file, which if you can't read that there, Etsy UDEV rules.d, 70 persistent net rules. What that actually does is on the, on the host itself, um, because it was going from one motherboard to another, that made sure that F0 would still refer to F0 and it wouldn't just be F1 after that. And then I shut the box down. I pulled the drive cage out of the old box, slid it into the new one, powered it up, done. We now have uh, four times as many cores, we now have eight times as much RAM. Everything is faster. Everything is more awesome. There was a whopping total of five minutes of downtime, and nobody had to reinstall anything, which is why, like I said, step four, bask in the glow of customers who love you. Now, the terrible thing about this is you might think that your customers will be like, wow, you are a god. I didn't even know you could do that. Unfortunately, they actually think that you've been able to do that for the past 20 years, and up until now, they've just always hated you because it wasn't what you did. Now you can do what they actually expect, which is totally cool. All right, so let's take a look at, this is, uh, this is Vert Manager right here. Vert Manager, uh, one of the most common things you might hear somebody sneeringly say about it if they're a real fanboy of another virtualization platform is, is Vert Manager is, is just so simple. There's just not much to it. I love that. It's a stone axe. It's a well-crafted stone axe. There's not a lot to break, and everything that, at least everything that I need to do, it's right there, it's easy to find, it's not buried under crap, it's just there. So what we're looking at over on the left is the actual uh, Vert Manager window itself, and we can see that we've got three machines running on localhost, um, and over here we've got one of them open to a console. It's a Windows 7 box, it's applying updates. What more do you really need to know? There's your box, it's running, it works. If you want to connect to a different one, double click it. Now you can do a lot more than that with KVM. I mean with Vert Manager. Uh, you can manage storage pools, you can set up multiple virtual networks as opposed to just one, or you can give your VMs direct access via bridge to the real network, it's all up to you. You can create or delete guests, you can change the allocation, you can even do a little bit of really basic performance monitoring of the guests, and I do mean seriously basic. This is not going to make Munin go away anytime soon, but it's there, you can get a quick look. And uh, of course, guest console access, mostly via VNC, although we'll talk about some alternatives later on. Now the other neat thing, and if you were at Bill Farrow's talk last time, you saw him start to touch on this. Uh, we, can we can manage virtual machines not just on our own machine, but on any machine that we can SSH to. In this screenshot where we're looking at Vert Manager, we've got our three machines on our local host up at the top, but then down below that, we've got another server that we're connected to by SSH, and we can see the, uh, you know, we can see four virtual machines running on that one, and then another one down there below it with more. So you can manage an entire fleet of hosts with guests on them, all from Vert Manager, all in one place, have them all show at once, and just go to whichever one you need to go to. This is something that I do every day. Um, I, have, uh, I have probably 40 or so hosts that I manage, and they're all set up in Vert Manager. It remembers my connections to all of them. You can tell it to automatically connect when you open Vert Manager, or it will just connect when you double click that host's entry and then it will show the VMs under that, which is generally what I do because I don't really want to wait for 40 SSH tunnels to open every time I open up Vert Manager. 
And of course, right over there, uh, the console that you see right there, the VPN virtual machine, that's not a guest that's on my local host. That actually is on, uh, that's, a, that's a machine in an engineering firm that's across the town. Actually, that's, uh, that's in South Carolina, and I took that screenshot up here in Charlotte. Um, of course, we shouldn't be any strangers to remote access, but still. I mentioned Linux infrastructure, and if you wondered what I meant by exposing Linux infrastructure to the guests, um, again, I, you know, I do a lot of work with Windows, specifically Windows servers. Um, and I, do, I, I normally work in the small business world, which means there's not a whole lot of budget to throw around. Um, so I don't just by default go, oh, well, hey, let me throw a $900 RAID card in that machine and connect up you know, whatever was hot in terms of SAS drives and whatever. I may just want to go, hey, let me get some commodity hardware and you know, let me put a simple four drive RAID 10 in, whatever. Well, if you want to do MD RAID, if you want to do LVM, if you want to do any of these super awesome things that Linux can do on the back end and Windows never in a million years thought about, or maybe they thought about it but thought they'd charge you extra for it, you can do that. And your guest doesn't need to know anything about it. Your guest just goes, duh, I have a C drive. But you can do all these great things in the background. <clears throat> all right, so if you actually want to install KVM, you could use the software center. That's not really the way I normally live, but if you like, and I'm going to assume Ubuntu for most of this. I'm an Ubuntu guy. Um, it's going to be pretty similar in any distro. Uh, if you're a Red Hat or CentOS type, basically just replace apt-get with yum, and it's pretty much the same thing. Um, but yeah, so on Ubuntu, apt-get install KVM, vert manager, and the last one is optional, Python Spice Client GTK. If you want to try to use Spice to control your guests instead of VNC, which we'll get into a little bit more later, you need that one. Um, that's one thing, if, if you've heard of Spice, if you came here wanting to learn about Spice, if you want to play with that later, that is the one note you should probably take right now, because there's not a real good pointer letting you know the one magical package that you actually do need to install to get it to work. And that's it, Python Spice Client GTK. So, not difficult. Actually setting up your first guest, super easy. Uh, do it right from the command line, vert install, connect. You, is anybody still paying attention? Yeah, I'm just kidding. Um, you can do that. That was, that was an example of how to actually install a guest from the command line. And if you find yourself needing to shell into a server headless somewhere, um, and you just don't have access to vert manager or any other tools, you can do anything vert manager does from the command line. But for something like installing a guest, it's going to be kind of painful. Um, you can control absolutely everything in that one command and get it done, but this is a case where I am a big fan of the GUI. So we just go to create a new virtual machine. Um, where we had vert manager and you saw you know, your host names like localhost, uh, you can just right click on one and say add new machine, add a new machine. This right here pops up. Give your virtual machine a name and uh, tell it the install type that you want. And most of the time I'm going to say uh, local install media, but you can import an existing image, you can do a pixie boot, you can do a network install, which I have never even begun to do that. But um, in this case, we're just going to install from local media, which is going to be a, uh, we're going to be using a Windows Server 2012 installation. And the cool thing is, you don't need to burn an actual CD or a DVD. If you have a physical one, sure, you can slap it in the drive and you can use that. But what I do, by far more often, is I just point to the ISO file, and that's good enough. It connects the ISO file to a virtual CD-ROM you boot for, or DVD-ROM. You boot from that and you're off to the races. Uh, below that, it did ask us to choose an operating system type and version. And you might be saying, well, didn't you just say you could virtualize everything and that was the great thing is it wasn't picky? It, it really isn't picky. And you can pick things that you won't find answers for down there. In particular, you might notice that I said we're going to do Windows Server 2008. We're really going to do Windows Server 2012. What, those, uh, what the operating system type and version there actually does is it tries to give you a good set of virtual hardware that it thinks will work out of the box with your particular guest. Um, if you have a guest that they never heard of or just didn't think about, like the first time I tried to virtualize PCBSD, just pick something you think might sound similar and you can work with it when you get there. Now we will uh, allocate RAM and CPU to the machine. and. Uh, one thing to keep in mind when it comes to allocating CPUs, if you have a dual core CPU, you can absolutely give your guests 16 CPUs. Um, performance may not be everything that you would hope. 
Uh, it, it's certainly possible to oversubscribe your total number of guests to the total number of CPU cores you have, but if they're actually really trying to hammer on all of them all at once, your performance will tank really quickly. So be reasonable. Also remember, uh, for any virtualization newbies out there, if you have a quad core processor, um, you might not want to give a guest four CPU cores. You can do it. And if your guest is fairly lightly loaded, it will work pretty well. But most of the time, it's a really good idea to reserve at least one core for your host. It actually does need some RAM and CPU of its own. Is there any reason to choose a higher number than the host? Uh, other than testing, no. Um, and even then, probably not. You should probably do something better than that. I just mentioned that in that one thing that you will if you do a lot of KVM, you may very well come to the point where you have more total guests and you want each of them to maybe have two cores and it all adds up to more cores you've got on your host computer. And if they're lightly loaded enough, that's perfectly reasonable and it will work perfectly well. However, if, you, you know, if they all try to peg the CPU as hard as possible at once, again, everything will work, but your total performance will definitely start to go downhill. Mm -hmm. What they actually ran into is a scheduling problem, and we actually got better performance out of all the virtual machines is if we looked at the load, and the load where, where the virtual machine only needed one core, set it to just one core, yeah. and your overall performance will be better. Absolutely true. Um, don't give virtual machines more stuff than they actually need. And actually, another thing about that is RAM. Believe it or not, uh, it, particularly when you've got Windows guests, you may find that uh, now if you give a Windows guest more RAM, it will cheerfully eat it right the heck up immediately. But what you may find when you're virtualizing is that you may find that you get better performance out of Windows guests when you actually give them less memory. Um, what happens is rather than attempting to page your applications out of RAM and do, uh, do I.O. caching, you know, disk caching itself in your Windows guest, with less RAM but enough to run the applications, they'll keep the application paged in. Meanwhile, your host with the RAM that you saved will do your I.O. caching on the host and when you have to reboot your Windows machine, which you will because it's Windows, you don't lose your disk cache. So it reboots really, really quickly. On the other hand, if you give your Windows guest as much RAM as you possibly can, it will manage it really badly, and it will lose all of it when you have to reboot it, which you will because it's Windows. Um, so yeah, give your, give your VM enough room to breathe here. And you know, the nice thing again is you know, this is all virtual. Um, even if it's Windows, you can just shut the thing down and change your allocation and reboot it and see if it runs better. Play with it. Do what works the best. Um, I don't talk a lot about virtualizing Linux in this particular talk, but one kind of neat thing that will blow your mind the first time you see it, if somebody like me hasn't spoiled it for you, um, if you've got a relatively modern Linux guest under KVM, if you go in while the guest is running and tell it, no, you don't have two gigs of RAM, actually you have four gigs of RAM, and it's been running the whole time, and now on the console you say free M, and it says, I have four gigs of RAM. Um, even more mind-blowing than that, assuming the guest has enough free memory to begin with, it's got four gigs of RAM, you tell it, no, 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 actually you only have 512 megs. Assuming it had that much free, it will just cheerfully tell you, oh, I've got 512 megs. And if you had more RAM than that actually taken, then the out of memory killer is going to come up and you're going to have a bad time, but, you know. And be aware you do the same thing, it's called hot app, hot app RAM, hot app CPU. Yep. All right, so the next step is to add storage for a VM. And, uh, and now this is, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. There are several different formats of storage that you can use. Um, you, can, you can feed a VM a, a, an entire raw disk drive. You can feed it raw storage in the form of just a file that's just raw data in a file. You can feed it LVM, logical volumes. But I honestly would not recommend you do any of those things that I just said. There's a file format called QCOW2 which um, it supports sparse allocation even if your file system underlying it doesn't, which means you can say, I want a 40 gig drive for my VM, and poof, it has what looks like a 40 gig drive, but until you actually put data in it on your actual host, you haven't stored anything. Uh, QCOW2 uh, also supports a lot of other features. You can do snapshots, uh, you can save your VM image, all kinds of things. 
you will hear a lot of talk to the effect that, oh, but if you really want your VM to perform super fast, you should totally feed it raw disks. You should really do testing before you get too crazy about that. You'll make your life. We, uh, I worked in uh, where we had exchange, and um, the Microsoft consultants said, put raw disks. Well, in our environment, when you try to move the um, <coughs> machine from one physical server to the other, it caused the, a kernel panic in Windows because it lost its hard drive in the move. So we, we went against Microsoft, Microsoft Consultant and did as in the image one. Yeah. What, what he's getting at is, you, when I, I mentioned there are a lot of other features in QCow2 you give up if you do raw storage. One of them is going to be the ability to migrate your VM live from host to host. That's only going to work on QCow2. If you use any kind of raw storage, nope, not going to happen. Um, so, that, I mean, the, the features are one of the big reasons that you want QCow2. Well, if if you're doing iSCSI, um, if you're doing if you're doing iSCSI on your Windows host, that's kind of a horse of a different color. That's kind of beyond what we're trying to get into right now. Yeah. For the moment, um, all we're really worried about is that when somebody says, oh, QCow2 performance sucks, don't do that. You should, you should either really test it yourself or at the very least look at some graphs that are out there from people who have, like myself, and we'll look at some a little bit later on. You really are not giving up much of anything in the way of performance for QCow2. I did thoroughly test it and came to the conclusion that there was no reason to make my life more difficult. Um, Whichever file system you have, uh, that ext4 does a great job. Um, if you want to get into, uh, if you want to get into d using a more advanced file system, so ext4 or xfs, either one is going to work just fine. Um, if you want to get into something a little bit uh, dicier, like uh, butter or zfs, most people will tell you that will be terrible and your performance will be awful and everything will suck and it will catch on fire. It's not really true. Um, for the most part, it doesn't. There can be corner cases, but whenever you start getting down into questions like that, a lot of it comes down into you should really test it for yourself. Um, for the most part, ZFS or Butter or anything is going to work really well. It's not just, oh, it works well enough that you'll get by. It works really well. There can be corner cases, but if you're in those corner cases, you really shouldn't, I mean, by the time you get down to one of those corner cases, if you're administering something that's under the kind of load that's really going to notice a difference between whether you're running ext4 or XFS or ZFS as your underlying file storage, you really should be in a position that you are doing your own testing and you know not raising your hand at conference, like that guy is. Okay, so so for the sake of camera, uh, of the camera, there's been a lot of questions and a lot of going back and forth about the backing file system as well as the storage type of KVM, and it boils down to whatever your file system is is almost certainly going to be fine, and you're probably not going to have any significant performance difference between using raw storage in any of millions of forms you can have it, or between QCow2, and you get a lot of extra features and ease of use with QCow2, so make your life simple use QCow2. All right, so in this case, we said we want a new storage volume. We said format QCow2. We told it 20 gigs, and we click finish, and we're ready to move on. All right, so that's it. We're ready to begin installation. We can see that we've got, uh, it, it says server 2008, but of course, again, that's just, we're going to give it a set of hardware that it thinks is good for 2008. Doing a local install, amount of RAM, amount of CPUs, 20 gigs of storage. We're just going to click finish and success. We are installing Windows Server 2012. That was not hard at all. It took me way longer to talk about it here than it does just to go click, 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 click and actually start your installation process. 
Now going back again to the horse that we already beat to death and beyond, I, I mentioned graphs and this is what I was talking about when I said uh, you know, raw disk storage is just totally not worth it. Um, this is a graph showing, uh, it's showing random I.O. using a Windows program called uh, HD Tune Pro. And what the graph actually is, is starting from the left, you've got 512 byte random access, uh, 4K, 64K, 1 meg, sequential, and over on the left is uh, read? Yeah, over on the left is read and over on the right is write. So it goes from 512 bytes all the way up to sequential and all the way back to 512 bytes. Right on the left, read on the right. The dark blue line on the very top is bare metal performance. And if you see the yellow line, that is KVM raw disk. The line that you can't quite see right underneath it that just mimics it in every conceivable way is QCOW2 on EXT4. Um, like I said, and, and there's, there are some other things on there. Uh, this, is, this is all no cache. We've got uh, EXT4 on a Z volume and, uh, and uh, XFS and QCOW2 and all kinds of things. But the point being here, there are really no perceptible performance differences to be had. Just use QCOW2. It really will make your life easier. If you don't believe me, do your own testing. Make your own graphs. All right, so I mentioned the hardware. And you know, we, we clicked through five steps and we're installing a Windows Server 2012 VM. And it really is that easy and it really does just work. But we can do a little bit better than that. Um, you know, like I mentioned, when we picked the operating system type and the actual operating system, all we're really doing is giving KVM some good guesses to make about what kind of fake hardware to prevent, present your guest with. And the, the guesses work, but they could be better even with what we've already got readily available. So, um, you know, we, it, it's, by default, it's giving us an RTL 8139 uh, network chipset, which if you don't know Realtek, you know, like the uh, back of your hand, that is a fast Ethernet card. That's not a gigabit card. And you might think, as I once did, uh, well, I'm sure it doesn't really matter. It'll just go as fast as the underlying network can go. No, 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 it won't. It really will be 100 megabit. I don't care what you connect it to. That's all you will ever get out of it. Um, you can see we're using an IDE disk. Um, it works. Um, in some cases, you may actually want to use IDE. You may, have a, uh, you may have a guess that there are no pair of virtual drivers for, in which case IDE will work, or you can feed it several kinds of fake SCSI drivers. Uh, but we'll be able to do better. And display VNC. Eh, uh, we can do better. It's not always that much worth doing better. Uh, Spice is your other option, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But so generic IDE disk controller, um, everything supports that because it looks just like every generic IDE chipset from you know the mid 90s on up. Every operating system on the planet knows what that thing is and will support it. Um, it's really, really slower than it could be though. Now the interesting thing is if you start doing all those crazy graphs like I did before and really throw a whole bunch of random data at it, you'll see how slow it really is. Your immediate perception, if you don't know any better, if you're installing, say, a Windows guest and you just use the default IDE drivers, might be, holy crap, everything disk related is way faster right now, which was the way I felt when I first got started with KVM. And perceptibly, it is. Um, because the host is managing your, your disk cache and because it persists between reboots, and frankly, because Windows can't get at the host's cache and page the cache out in favor of other stupid things from time to time, Everything actually feels quicker, even with the IDE drivers. However, um, when you actually get down to the point of pushing the actual drives and you're past the cache, you'll get much better performance if you replace the IDE controller with Vert.io, which I'll show you how to do in a few minutes. RTL8139, uh, wide native support, no gigabit. Um, E1000, you don't even have to go into the pair of virtual drivers. It's just that little combo box where it says, what kind of NIC do I have? You can say E1000, which is an Intel Pro 1000 uh, gigabit card. It's right there. You can just click into that. It just works. Every Windows since Vista, at least, has supported it natively. Uh, I mean, without an additional driver? I wasn't sure about XP. So yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. Why they still use that as a default, I don't know. But even if you don't want to use the Vert.io net driver, please change that over to E1000. Unless, of course, you just have an ancient, crusty, fast Ethernet network of your own, in which case it won't matter. Um, if you're really feeling frisky, you can try the Vert.io network driver. Now, I'm not quite sure what the status on the Windows uh, Vert.io net driver is right now. I have had issues with it in the past. 
Um, it will work great for a week and then just all of a sudden it does not work anymore until you reboot your guest. And then at some point it does the same thing and then eventually you say screw this and go back to an E1000. That may have all been fixed right now. So, you know, if you're in a testing frame of mind, test it. Um, if you do not want to test it, then just use the E1000. It'll do pretty damn well. Uh, in, in actual practice, uh, I can usually come pretty close to saturating a gigabit network using the E1000 virtual driver. You do get better performance out of Vert.io. It may or may not be worth it there. If the stability is there, it'll be worth it, but I don't know if it's there yet, and I don't want to lead you wrong. Okay, so finally VNC VGA. Um, again, wide native support. The con here is latency. Um, if you've ever used VNC before, then you know that VNC can be pretty slow. Um, this is not as big a problem as it used to be. Five years ago, the, uh, the, the latency in using Vert Manager with a VNC console was really significant even on the local host. You would sometimes wave your mouse across your console and watch the little arrow go trailing behind it like a little lost puppy. Um, that's not really the case anymore. It's actually really pretty snappy and I think we'll have enough time to hopefully do a little bit of a demo of that. But if you want to do better, um, you can use Spice and Kixel. Uh, Spice is a Red Hat technology which is optimized for really high bandwidth, really low latency networks to give you everything, super flashy color. It actually pulls sound through, kind of like HDMI, um, which is pretty neat. You know, if you're just trying to kind of like have a Windows workstation on your machine and you want to hear the little sound when you boot your Windows box and whatever else you might want to do, Spice does a pretty good job with it. Um, for work type stuff, to be honest, I mostly just, I don't use the console much. I use RDP. When I have Windows Server VMs and I, need to, and I need to connect to them remotely, unless something is broken with them, I RDP into them just like they were bare metal boxes. Honestly, the, the, the open source world doesn't have a real good answer to RDP yet. The closest thing is FreeNX and it's a pain in the butt and it's only Linux and it still doesn't really quite perform as well. RDP does really well over a wide variety of networks. Um, in particular, if you're super excited about Spice because you think it will do a better job across a WAN than your VNC connections have in Vert Manager, I will go ahead and disabuse you right now. I don't have a demo for that for you today, but it actually sucks worse than VNC. It's great on the local host. That's the only thing it's good for right now. About what now? I think I haven't heard of it. All right, so if you've got a Windows guest, um, how do you actually get the drivers for this Vert.io stuff? Uh, the easy way is just go to spicespace.org, download, and you download an executable. Um, it's the Spice guest tools. You run it and it will, it will install all of the pair of virtualized drivers for the Windows OS. So you get the, uh, you get the Kixel drivers for Spice video, you get the network driver if you decide to expose a, a Vert.io network card, you get the storage driver, you get a memory balloon driver, all that stuff all in one fell swoop. You don't even ever have to hit the, uh, the device manager. So that's pretty handy if you're doing Server 2008 or if you're doing Windows 7 or anything earlier than that. However, if you're doing Server 2012 or Windows 8.1, ha ha, no, you can't do that. Um, in Windows 8 and in Server 2012, Microsoft changed video device driver models. So the Kixel driver won't work, so the, uh, you can't have Spice at all. And in fact, the Spice guest tools installer will bomb out. However, you can still have Vert.io. Um, this right here is on uh, Fedora Project, their list of the Vert.io drivers. There's an ISO there. You can download that ISO. You can connect it as a virtual CD-ROM to your guest, and you can do the old device manager Fandango after you have gone and changed here your storage type. Actually, we're going a little bit more than that. So we're going to do the device manager thing. But here's the thing. If you've already installed your guest on IDE, how do you get the Vert.io storage drivers instead? Won't Windows just blue screen? There's a trick to it. You don't have to just stop and reinstall Windows all over again. The first thing that you do is you create a little dribbly throwaway drive uh, for your guest, a second hard drive with a Vert.io driver. So we just made a little, you know, 0.1 gig drive, and you can't see because it, it cut me off down at the bottom, but I picked Vert.io for the drive type. 
And in here, I uh, went over to my CD-ROM and I clicked the connect button and I connected it to my uh, Vertio ISO that I just downloaded. So now Windows is going to actually see that as a CD in the drive. And now we see that we have this random SCSI controller that just popped up in our device manager that wasn't there before. That's your Vertio controller. And that won't show up there without that little extra drive that you just added. But since it's a second drive, Windows still boots because nothing has changed with its main drive yet. So we rebooted, we got that. We click update driver software and we feed it the driver. And now we restart the machine. I skipped the step in here, we went back and now this time we got rid of that little extra throwaway drive we added and we changed the drive type for our main drive from IDE to Vert.io, but Windows has installed the driver now and it just boots right on up. Um, it boots considerably faster. Now, if you were thinking ahead and you want to do this from the start, you're like, well, hey, what about that part when you're installing Windows Server when it says, you know, what if you want to install like a SCSI driver? Yes, you can totally do that from the CD2 and skip this whole thing. You can set it up with Vert.io storage from the get-go before you ever install it. And when you get to the thing, press F whatever to load additional drivers. You can connect your Vert.io ISO then, but I never remember to do that ahead of time, which is why I wanted to make sure I told you how to do it the hard way. Exactly. And then we just removed it again the second we installed the driver. There's, just, there's no other easy way to get Windows to install the driver where it needs to go. Because, you know, I mean, you could find the INF and right click it and say install, and that sounds like something that would work, but nah, it doesn't work. So you need the actual piece of hardware there to install the driver on, and you can't do it on the main disk because Windows would blue screen before it booted, so that's what you do. And then you throw away your little extra drive and change the main drive over to Vert.io, and everything's good. All right, so VNC, Spice, or RDP. Like I said, um, you can swap out the VNC console in Vert Manager with one for Spice, which is pretty nifty on the local host. Um, but your three options are VNC, Spice, and RDP. RDP assuming, of course, that you got Windows on the other end, or you want to set up XRDP, for those of you out there who are really crazy. Um, they all have their pros and cons. Uh, VNC, for the most part, is good enough for almost anything you want to do. It just works. It's not the best thing out there. I mean, you know, there are better performance characteristics with nearly anything, but it just works and it's already there. And you probably don't really need to replace it unless you just like to fiddle. Um, if you do like to fiddle, there's Spice. Uh, shiny, bundled audio, your beeps come through, low local latency, but it's not that reliable yet, unfortunately. Um, I was going to do, instead of doing a live demo, I was going to do a GTK record my desktop and just kind of record some movies of, uh, you know, me doing some stuff on consoles. And when I was trying things like uh, playing, uh, playing video clips over a guest that had Spice video installed, it would work for quite a while, and then all of a sudden I would get rainbowy crap and I'd need to reboot my guest. So it's, it's reliable enough to work for hours and hours and hours and hell, days and days and days if you're not trying to do crazy stuff for a presentation. Um, on just, you know, whatever little workstation that you're doing to do the thing that you have your one Windows thing for yourself. But if you're setting up a Windows server for production and, you know, 20 plus people are going to be relying on that thing, I can't really recommend Spice right now. You're not going to get anything good out, enough out of it to be worth an extra possibility that your Windows machine might lock up. Finally, RDP. Um, low latency, low bandwidth, works everywhere, utterly reliable. Honestly, it kicks the pants out of everything else. Um, but it's not part of Vert Manager. So uh, for Linux guests, it's an extra pain in the butt. You would actually have to set up XRDP to use RDP, to go to an RDP gateway into VNC, to blah, 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 blah. It works, but it's a pain. Windows guests, it will just work to get into the guests, but you don't have a console. Um, your biggest disadvantage about not having a console with RDP is what happens when your Windows guest is being troublesome and a pain in the butt and not doing what you want it to during boot time, which eventually it will because it's Windows. And if you don't have an actual console, you can't get into the thing. It will get all the way through the boot process, assuming it does, and then you can RDP into it and get a desktop. But if you wanted to watch it booting, you're out of luck. You've got to do that in the console, which is going to mean Invert Manager using Spice or VNC. Quick question for you. Yeah. Probably Spice. Um, honestly, I haven't done a lot of messing around with that because I can't for the life of me figure out, other than like ask, answering questions on Stack Exchange from a clean machine, I don't really have a whole lot of call to have a Linux desktop virtualized on my Linux desktop. So 
I haven't played with it much, but in general what I've discovered is that the Vert.io drivers have pretty much always been rock solid for Linux guests, whereas they've been improving over time for the Windows guests. There was a time that I wouldn't mess with the Vert.io storage driver on Windows either. That time has passed. Uh, the Vert.io storage driver on Windows now is rock solid. I have not seen any issues with it in probably 60 plus guests in like two, three years. Um, but yeah, there was a time then I, when I wouldn't do that either. It was, it was IDE only. Um, but yeah, that entire time and before, my first experiences with KVM actually were uh, Linux server guests virtualized on a Linux server. And everything by default goes in Vert.io and everything just, you never have to think about it. It all just works. So you wouldn't do anything different on Linux. Any comments on NX no machine? It exists. It's a pain in the butt. I don't really like it. I don't use it. That's my comment. Um, well, the first comment is I'd rather get back into the demos here. We can go way deep in a rabbit hole on here. In a nutshell, if it works for you, awesome. If it doesn't work for you, it's probably because it's extremely high bandwidth and it's not really, really designed for any kind of remote access stuff. It, it might work, but it's a hack. All right. So now let's fire up Vert Manager. Okay, and oh wow, such low resolution. This is going to be fun. <coughs> it's actually not too bad. I'm, I'm really glad at this point that I don't normally pick super high resolutions for my Windows VMs. Yeah. Alrighty. It's solid state. All right. Um, wow, yeah, and we can't even get down to the start button. This is going to be fun. OK, so this is your default VNC console. Um, there's, there's nothing special going on here. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yay. OK, so like I said, there's nothing special going on. This is your default VNC. As you can see, I mean, there's nothing visibly wrong with it. You know, everything looks pretty good. Uh, we'll go ahead and open up GIMP here. And I will mention, by the way, this is the first time this Windows VM has been booted on this machine since this machine has been booted last. Um, yeah, there's a solid state drive in here, but still, when I said KVM performance was good, I wasn't kidding. All right, so GIMP and... And of course, we have to scroll back up again. You just change the mode? Yeah, I could, but what, where would be the fun in that? <laughs> there's, there's the scale button. There's, there's, uh, yeah, I don't know. Let's give that a shot. I've never tried that on a smaller screen. Cool. There you go. Click the full screen button. I don't normally want to, I mean, that's, that's the full screen button. It's not normally the like scale down to, you know, small or whatever. And I don't normally use it because I like having my windows contained in a little box on my desktop. Um, I like to see the jail around it. But yeah, if, if you want to forget that you're on Linux, other than the fact that, you know, it maybe sucks slightly less than it would have otherwise, you can do that too. All right. So um, like I said, obviously we're, you know, this, this is not terrible. This is our VNC console. And I'm frankly having more trouble working my touchpad while I look 90 degrees off to the side than I am with the console itself. Even if we don't want to do something relatively crazy like, man, I can't even see those icons over there. Rotate, where are you? Man, this is awful. All right. Forget this. Give me just one second. Let me mirror my displays because this is horrible. Somebody got a question back there? Well, I was just going to ask, is it, because like, I'm not the one operating the touchpad, is it lagging at all? No. No. No, it's not. No, no, my only issue is using the touchpad while doing this. Like, I'm pretty good at using the touchpad while I'm looking at the laptop, but it's harder than you might think if you've never done it, cranking your neck around like that and trying to touchpad around and tap and drag. 
Alright. Uh, I really haven't because unless you unless you go do crazy stuff on your own, it's all going to be installed for you and it will all just work. Um, that's not something that you have to go and do yourself. When you set this guest up, it's actually going to set up a tablet driver and you might ask yourself, why did it set up a tablet driver? I don't have a tablet. And the answer is to fix some lag issues with cursor placement in VNC, in Vert Manager, but basically it's, it's already there, it already works. You don't really have to worry about it. If you ever decide to go and delete that tablet hardware and you notice that you have some weirdness with cursor placement though, that's why, and just put it back and that'll get fixed. Is anybody else here a GIMP user and can point me in the right direction for the freaking rotate tool? Well, that'll work actually. So, if one wanted to do something crazy with the image, Again, this is the default VNC. You can see a little bit of lag there while I'm stretching that around, but it's not horrible. It's completely usable. We'll do way better with Spice now, but I just basically wanted to get the impression across that, you know, unless you just really, really want to fiddle with it, you really don't need to do much of anything different. The VNC console is, is really pretty sufficient. All right. So let's shut this down. And let's fire up. This is a clone of the exact same uh, VM, but in this case, I've installed the Spice channels on it and the uh, Spice guest tools. So they work under Windows 7, don't work under 8, 8.1. Don't work under uh, 8, 2012 or above. Yet, uh, the Red Hat guys are going to have to come up with uh, WDDM display drivers. If you didn't hear that over my loud voice, that was the ding 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 of Windows playing on my laptop because, again, when we do Spice, uh, we actually get the sounds to come through. Can you have VNC and Spice? No, not at the same time. You can, swip the, you can switch the same VM backwards and forwards from VNC to Spice, but in the interest of time, I thought it would be better just to have two VMs set up with it. But you can have RDP and Windows too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can RDP into either one, it doesn't matter. Um, I mean, yeah, it's completely independent. That's all on the Windows side. All right. Yeah, yeah. You're using all Microsoft code for that. Did I miss my click? There we go. Ah, uh, well, whatever. Okay, so we've got our pretty flowers and we want to do some crazy stuff to it. And you can see that it's, it's, uh, it's a bit less laggy, but it's, it's honestly not a huge difference. Um, you don't really see a difference until you start trying to do something really crazy like watching YouTube videos or, you know, which we're not going to do here because I refuse to rely on the internet bandwidth of the conference. No offense to Zach Underwood. Um, I do have a, uh, a movie here on the desktop, and this will be enough to make Spice lose its lunch um, if we play it full screen. This is a 720p sample video that comes with Windows. Um, oh no, that's the Sintel video, and that will make it lose its lunch really fast. This is the Windows sample video. And you can't hear it, but the sound, you know, which is just some like harpsichordy crap playing in the background, is coming through my laptop speakers here as we watch the horses run. Yay! Um, I should have done this on VNC as well. It would suck worse than what you see here if we were doing it on VNC by a long shot. You'd actually see screen tearing with every single frame where you got about one frame every five or six seconds. Um, However, this is not supposed to be a succession of still images. We've overloaded the amount of bandwidth that we can handle with Spice with you know, our full 32-bit color and 720p and full screen. On the other hand, if we wanted to do something like, um, it's still not completely unworkable. If we drag this down to a smaller size, it will actually play flawlessly. And you notice this time, you know, there's no hitching and glitching. And as if we could actually tell the difference is if you could hear it or it was anything but plink, 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 the music doesn't get out of sync either. Um, 
For stuff like just watching low-res YouTube videos, Spice will actually work for that. Just, you know, don't expect to watch your HD stuff that you downloaded. Where, where is the bottleneck sitting? This is all in the machine, right? This isn't going over a wired network. Uh, no, it, it is all on localhost uh, going from the VM to the host. And honestly, where exactly the bottleneck is, I do not know what to tell you. Um, I mean, ultimately, it comes down to you just don't have enough network bandwidth for that amount of traffic. I mean, there's a reason that HDMI cables are expensive. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, is, that is future forward, though. Um, another thing that is in theory present right now but won't do you any good in Vert Manager um, the uh, Spice server and client support remote cut and paste, so you can cut stuff on the VM and paste it in your guest or vice versa. In theory, but you're going to have to actually roll your own Spice server and Spice client if you want that to actually work, because it's not implemented in Vert Manager yet. In Vert Manager, it does not in Windows. Hats off to you, sir. Hats off to you. Let's see if we can get back where we were. <laughs> All right. Um, so actual host management, I mentioned that uh, we're, what we did right here is we right clicked on the host, uh, which in this case was uh, gwinc.net, one of my clients, and we're looking at uh, the, uh, I right clicked on that and hit properties and the connection details came over there, and we can see CPU usage and memory usage on the host itself. Uh, we also have tabs for virtual networks, for storage pools, and for network interfaces on that host. And the most important thing about that and uh, one of the things that took me a long time to figure out was storage pools. Um, for a long time, I was a happy KVM and Vert Manager user, but didn't really know what a storage pool was or why I cared about it. And a lot of the answer is, <clears throat> once you start managing remote hosts the way I do a lot of, if you, if you haven't added the storage that you're actually using on those machines into a storage pool, then it'll be fine when you go to set up a machine while you're sitting there at the actual host, uh, you can tell it browse and you can just go through the local file system and say, okay, that's the ISO I want to use, or here's the QCAL2 file I want to use, and it doesn't have to be in a pool, it'll just work. It'll continue to work, and you can play with it remotely and whatever, but if you actually go to set up a new machine or maybe connect you know, a virtual CD to an existing machine and the files that you want to use aren't in a pool, you won't be able to find them remotely. It just won't work. So what you actually need to do is just take the directories that you're going to be using with KVM, and if they're not already part of a storage pool, add them in. So what we're going to do here, so I clicked storage and, and uh, I clicked, now this is, this is a thing that took me forever, I'm a little embarrassed about, but if you look to the left of the dialog, this is add new storage pool, there's a little green plus, that's the thing you click to add a new storage pool. I looked for forever as to how to add one and, and came up empty until finally I spotted the little green plus. And once I found the little green plus, I cursed a lot, and I resolved to myself that every time I talked about KVM to people, I would tell them about the little green plus. So just in case there's anybody else out there like me, they could learn about it. So did you also have issues with the fact that when you declare a storage pool is some dirt, that all of the subdirectories underneath there were not, it's not something you could click and just send down into? I noticed it. It mildly annoyed me, but it's not a huge deal for me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a true fact, and it's annoying. It, but it, yeah, it, it is what it is. Um, so anyway, and here, so we got to add a new storage pool. And back then, I was using I was using L, LVM and just feeding raw LVs um, to KVM. You know, chasing that extra elusive you know storage performance. 
that eventually after a couple of years of using it in production, I tested and discovered wasn't really there. I'd had all kinds of people telling me about it. Oh, you'll get so much better performance if you feed it, you know, raw logical volumes. No, you don't. Um, you don't get any worse performance, but it's a whole lot of extra steps to jump through for not a whole lot of point. But anyway, so you go to add a storage pool and you pick a type. And there I picked the type logical volume group. And you can feed it a volume group. Or you can uh, feed it a directory. Or there's a couple other options I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, and so then your next step after that, you have added it. And uh, you can see the stuff that's in there. Now in this case, we're looking at a volume group that we've added as a storage pool. So we see the logical volumes beneath it. If we'd added a directory, we would see the files in that directory. Um, so, you know, none of this is exactly you know, mind-blowing. Like I said, the real point behind it is so that when you're shelling into, uh, when you're using Vert Manager to shell into this box from across the country later and you want to add a VM and you want to add storage, you have to add it into a pool before Vert Manager will see it from a remote location. So that's why you actually care about that. Yeah, and there's where we can actually, um, you, can, you can manually add a new volume under your storage pool from Vert Manager if you want to. To be honest, I actually usually use uh, QEMU IMG from the command line uh, to create a new volume. But if you're allergic to the command line, you can do it right there from within Vert Manager and it will work. The one annoying thing is that even when you tell it format QCAL2, it will still put dot .image on the end of your file. Um, it won't stop it from working, but if you're me, at least, it will annoy you and lead you to choose the command line instead. Last tool we want to talk about, VertTop. Um, I had also been using KVM in production for a long time before somebody just casually mentioned VertTop, and I was like, whoa, what? Um, there's, you can apt-get install VertTop, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's top for VMs run on your guest from the command line. Uh, you can see your actual columns here. You've got an ID for the guest. And then you've got read and write requests on your drive. Um, so those are actual those are actual I/O operations you're seeing there. Um, read and write requests. Then you've got uh, received and transmitted bytes on your uh, network interface for the guest. Percent CPU for the guest. Percent memory uh, uptime. And then of course the guest name itself. Um, you can uh, much like top itself. There are some uh, special magic keys you can press to change some of those columns, sort by them, whatever. The, most, uh, the one that I get the most use out of is if you press, I want to say it's capital B, you can shift the uh, read request and write request for the storage from uh, requests down into actual you know, bytes transferred in and out. So if you want to see, you know, oh, hey, I'm, doing, I'm writing like 80 megs a second onto my drives, instead of seeing you know, like three write requests, then you can do that. Or if you know, you say, oh, well, gee, I'm, I'm only moving, you know, like uh, a meg a second, you know, onto this drive where things so slow, you can toggle back over and see, oh, because my write request is stacked, you know, like literally 1,200 requests deep. That's why it's so slow. That's VertTop. And that's what I got today. Anybody got any questions? Does VertTop show remote host too? VertTop does not. There may be some magical way to do it, but I don't know about it. Let me say that. One command did mention uh, Versh. Uh, yeah, uh, Versh is the Versh is the. Uh, I mentioned you can do everything from the command line that Vert Manager does. Uh, Vert install was the command that you saw that you know filled the entire screen with all the arguments to set up a VM. Uh, Versh is the command that you use to interact with running VMs, and you can do basically everything with it. You can Versh start a machine, you can Versh stop a machine, you can Versh destroy a machine, you can use a really long command line to actually you know, add hardware or remove hardware from a machine. You can save it, you can snapshot it, assuming you used QCOW2. Um, you can do all kinds of things, and literally I could fill three of these talks with just nothing but all the stuff you can do with Versh. The reason I did not try to fill a talk with the stuff you can do with Versh is honestly, I almost never use it day to day. About all I ever do with Versh is I may you know, be shelled into the host and not have Vert Manager open to it and just Versh start or Versh stop a machine. Um, the one other thing that I will do is uh, you can actually, you can edit the, so when you, when you set up a VM, um, there's really only two things that exist that comprise the VM. One is your storage, which hopefully you listen to me, and it's one simple QCOW2 file. And the other thing is a very small XML file that defines the hardware of the machine itself. 
um, that on Ubuntu that actually lives in uh, etc. libvirt bin, no, etc. libvirt qemu. Um, and th there will be an XML file there for each of your guests. And you can actually edit those directly if you want. Um, there's a, you can say versh edit to edit, them, to edit them, which if you have not already carefully set your editing environment variable will dump you into VI, which may make you unhappy or you may like it. It makes me unhappy. Um, I'm far more likely to just nano the XML file, save it, which uh, when, when you nano it and save it, the important thing to realize is you have not actually edited your VM. None of those changes will be paid attention to by KVM yet. If you want those changes that you made to that XML file to actually do anything to anybody anywhere ever, what you need to do now is you need to say verse define and the name of your VM and it will pick that up from that XML file and it will save that and it will still be that way the next time you run it. Um, like I said, there's tons of things you can do with Versh. Um, I've, so I've seen clone before. Uh -huh. I've looked for a snapshot. Uh, I've never found it. Is that something you still have to do through Versh? Uh, you can do it through Vert Manager. You can do it through Versh. Honestly, um, So the thing about that is, yes, you can take a snapshot without stopping your VM, but unless you have a guest agent on your VM that will actually maintain, that will actually quiesce it, um, there's not necessarily a guarantee that it will be in a good condition when you boot it back up, um, because of course you're not you're not actually you're not hibernating it. So nothing that's in RAM will be there if you try to roll back that snapshot. You'll be booting from a snapshot of that storage and dealing with whatever you've got. Now, in practice, in most cases, that will actually be OK. Um, every modern operating system uses a journaling file system that's specifically designed to deal with the power getting yanked out of the back, which is effectively what you're doing if you take a snapshot on a running VM and then boot it later. And the vast majority of databases these days um, are also journaling and will recover more or less pretty gracefully um, you know, from, from you just taking a snapshot of it running and then booting back into it. However, as a conscientious sysadmin, you should actually evaluate your environment and decide if that works for you or not. There are some guest agents for some guest operating systems that you may be able to rely on to actually key S your guest. I can't talk really intelligibly about that, to be honest with you. Do you have an easy way to expand your storage after you allocated it and used it? Uh, yes, you do. In particular, if you used QCAL2 storage like I asked you to, <laughs> You can just shut down your guest and you can expand the size of your QCAL2 file. Um, I think you can do that from Vert Manager, but I use, uh, I use the, 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 uh, the command QMU-IMG from the command line. Um, it's pretty simple. It's got a man page. It works. Um, you can just expand the size. And when you boot back into your guest, now your partition tables and everything on your guest won't have changed a bit. But you will now have a guest that's sitting in you know, this much disk on a disk that's now magically this big. So like in Windows, for example, you would just go right on into computer management and storage management. And you'll now see that your Windows partition only goes out this far. And you click on it, and you drag it all the way out to the end, and you're done. Everything's expanded. Yes. And is there any problem with write application and so forth? None that I've seen. Um, if, if you're doing, you know, I mean, if, if you're running like, you know, this super crazy database that, you know, 50,000 people are all hitting concurrently and blah, 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 then sure, you may have more problem with, you know, that than the other. But if you're doing all that, you probably shouldn't be asking me questions itself. Um, basically, I mean, it boils down to if you, it, this is a thing of, yes, there are corner cases where you can have performance problems. But you already know about it if you're running that kind of a load. If you're not sure and you're like, well, I don't know, you know, the, the 10 or 15 or 150 users in my office, sometimes they hit the old server kind of hard. That's not a hard workload. Um, a hard workload is when you've got a database server that's backing an application server that generates about 80 gigs a day of Apache logs on page views alone. That's a hard workload. And that can work for KVM too, but you may need to be more careful with it. Um, your basic like, oh, well, I have a server and I want it to feel fast when I use it. 
that's not a heavy workload and you really should not just go crazy killing yourself with, oh no, what if I'll have a little right amplification from this or that or the other? No, it's, performance is good. Does that answer your question? Yay. Yes. Yes. And, and that is one gotcha. Um, if you have cryptic messages and your guest won't start, um, go into BIOS and make sure that hardware virtualization is enabled. A lot of motherboards, for I do not know what reason why, they ship with virtualization disabled. Um, why that is, I don't know other than to piss me off, but there it is. Don't do that. I'm a big fan of the fact that KVM is, uh, KVM is part of the kernel. Um, if, if you're running Linux, you're running the Linux kernel, KVM is right there. The, the packages that you're installing, that's not really for KVM itself. That's for the tools to access KVM with. Um, it's going to be, if there is one thing that I have learned in the last 20 years of my career, it's don't bet against Linux. This is part of Linux. Um, there are other virtualization technologies that have been around longer and that have had, you know, th they've enjoyed some advantages, some disadvantages, but in the long run, I really like, A, knowing that it's going to be there. I don't need to worry about, oh, well, will this work on my distribution or will they stop maintaining it for that? Or will it work on CentOS but not work on Ubuntu, blah, 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 nah, nah, none of all that. It's part of the kernel. It will work. Um, in addition to that, like I said, you know, I have a lot of, of real world experience with it. Not just as, you know, and there's nothing wrong with playing around with a virtual workstation on your laptop, but to me there's a big difference between that and, you know, actually doing production stuff. I've got about five years of actually doing production servers that people rely on with KVM, and I have always been extremely impressed with its reliability and its performance. Um, I feel very good about it. I do not feel that good about VirtualBox. I'll be honest, I don't have anywhere near the ex amount of experience with VirtualBox I do with KVM, but it feels like a toy to me. Sorry for any virtual box fans. But like you said, KVM does require the virtualization. So if you happen to have an old machine that doesn't have that, you use virtual box. Yeah, and, and like seriously, <laughs> pour lots of coffee. Um, if, you, if, if any of you have ever done virtualization without hardware virtualization supports, well, I, I'm guessing it's those of you with the more impressive beards because they give you time for it to grow. <laughs> Yes, you can. You can pass a USB hardware port directly through to the guest, and your host does not know anything about it, does not care, just passes all the info from the port straight in. You don't need any device drivers on your host. So like, if you have some kind of really annoying uh, you know, USB DRM dongle for your Windows whatever, and you know, they don't, you know, the vendor doesn't support Linux, whatever, just pass that port straight through to the guest, it'll be fine. Um, the only issue with that is you are literally passing one single USB port through. So, you know, if you have a user go and plug the USB thing into just whichever random port they come across on your host, not going to work. It needs to be the one that you actually forwarded through. Can you also tap that sniffer? Is it, is it go through network and use something like a, what's a, what's a sniffer everybody uses? So you can put your network in your Wireshark. Wireshark. Yeah, the, the networking stuff, I mean, it's, it's either going to go through a, uh, a standard Linux bridge or else it's going to go to, uh, if you do the virtual thing, then it'll go through a virtual bridge. But either way, there's an actual network interface you can sniff. So you're either like, uh, for mine here, I was actually using uh, VirBR0, but I mean, you've got VirBR0 for the virtual stuff. It's a virtual bridge. All your guest traffic that are using Verbero will go through that. You can set up multiple virtual network interfaces if you want to, for whatever reason, to have completely separate networks, separate guests. They'll each get, you know, a VIRBR network interface that shows up on the host. Or you can, like, if you've got a bridge set up on your guest, you can feed them real IP addresses from your actual LAN directly in through BR0. Any of all these you sniff with whatever tools you normally sniff with. No. No support yet for ARM? Well, I mean, actually, yes, there is. But I mean, now you're not really talking KVM. You're talking QEMU. And yes, QEMU supports software emulation. Well, well no, I'm just talking about the virtualization. No, no, it's so, ARM. So, so KVM is, is, is working on ARM. And uh, the other <coughs>
over for a, a, which is more like vSphere, but it's a Red Hat supported uh, open source project, and you can have lots of sort of virtual things. And it's, instead of having a X Windows command line, it has a web interface. Um, so there's another project called Kimchi, which is sort of part of that, and it's more of like one box. I've got one server and another virtual machine, and uh, IBM is working on that extensively actually for Power 8. Um, so they're going to sell you uh, sort of a big IBM box, but it's going to be running KVM virtualization um, and have a web-based management for it. Sorry, I didn't realize you're talking about the host being on a different architecture. Yeah. I thought you were talking about you know ARM guests. I think they're going to start like coming up here with the cane and dragging me off the stage now. So, wow. thanks, guys. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.